so what I'm going to talk about today is staying active while at home. Um, and just into, to introduce myself, I'm an accredited exercise physiologist. I'm also a life program facilitator, currently involved in running my own life groups within the community. Um, so today, in amongst everything that's going on at the moment with COVID-19, hopefully you'll be able to get something out of today's presentation in how you can increase your physical activity at home. We've got a few more coming through. Hello, we're just getting started. You haven't missed anything yet. All right. So within my role as an exercise physiologist, I do work with clients with a range of chronic conditions and I use exercise to help um, manage those conditions also through the use of education. I also do see a lot of clients for the prevention of different chronic conditions as well. So exercise is our main modality. Uh, we do see a lot of clients with um, conditions ranging from diabetes, heart disease, stroke, um, different neurological conditions, um, for general lifestyle advice, weight management, so forth. Hello to a few more coming through. So we're just getting started. Let's go back. So before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the Kulin Nations, where my colleagues are located today. I pay my respects to elders past and present and to Aboriginal people participating today. So this is just some background. Um, hello to the, to the other participants coming through um, for today's webinar. So we do have a life member um, who will be looking at taking questions. So you can write your questions in as the webinar is going through. It should take about 45 minutes. It's the time that it's scheduled for. Um, all webinar participa participants will be muted to allow myself to present without any interruption uh, with the background noise. Questions, like I said, you can submit via the Q&A tab on your webinar screen, uh, which is at the bottom of your screen there. Um, if you miss out on a question during uh, the webinar, you can also email livewebinars at diabetesvic.org.au and they will get back to you. You will receive a recording of this webinar and the answers to the questions asked. And at the conclusion of the webinar, we do ask if you could please click the link provided to complete the feedback survey. All right. So just a couple of statistics that I like to go through at the beginning um, in relation to lifestyle. So we know that 80% of type two diabetes is preventable through a healthy lifestyle. Um, and that's why you're all involved in the life course to try and prevent um, type two diabetes, heart disease and stroke. Some more statistics, we know that children with at least one inactive parent are 68% more likely to be inactive. So I found this a really interesting statistic um, in just the role that we play with our children. So if you do have children at home, they're more than likely um, to be watching your behaviours and also following, I guess, in your footsteps. So trying to set a real positive um, example. We also know and research has shown that 76% of Aussie adults don't do enough strength training. So I like to focus on this during my presentation. A lot of the time we're overloaded with the importance of cardiovascular training and why that's really important. Uh, but I don't feel like there's enough emphasis placed on strength training, particularly as we get older. So in this webinar, I would like to go through in a little bit more detail why that's important, for prevention of diabetes, for our overall health and wellbeing, and why it's really important to integrate that into our exercise plan. Okay, so the next slide I just wanted to touch on this whole COVID-19 um, pandemic and the reasons to leave the house in highlighting that one of the reasons we are actually allowed to go outdoors is to exercise. So, Again, just highlighting the importance of remaining active during this period of time when we may be in isolation um, and staying at home, there are ways that we can remain active. 
It might look a little bit different. We can't get out into the gym or sometimes we can't take the kids out to the park, um, but trying to get creative with our plans so we can still get the positive health benefits of being active. Okay, so this slide is looking at our risk factors and the possible effect um, with our lifestyle. So we've got on the left-hand side, all of our modifiable risks. Uh, the first one being obesity. So we know that that's going to reduce with exercise along with healthy eating. We can see with exercise, our waist circumference will reduce. Uh, that's one of our biggest risk factors with type two diabetes. Um, because it is where we start to build a lot of insulin resistance. So if we can help to reduce our waist circumference with a healthy eating plan, with an exercise plan, we can actually improve um, that insulin function there. Our blood pressure reduces, our serum triglycerides reduces, and our HDL cholesterol, which is our good cholesterol, actually increases. So Again, just all the reasons why we should be incorporating some physical activity into our life. So this slide, I would like to touch on the benefits of physical activity. In particular, the first tick is with our mental health. So at the moment, um, this is really important if you're finding hardships at home um, for many different reasons. It's really important to engage in a regular exercise routine to help to boost your overall mental health. We know that there's a lot of studies to support exercise and brain function um, in delaying, um, I guess, cognitive decline as we get older. Um, a lot of um, information around improving our energy levels and our overall general health and well-being. We know that physical activity will help to reduce type two diabetes reduce some chronic diseases and even some cancers. Um, also reduce the incidence rate of heart disease. So again, as exercise physiologists, we do work across a range of different chronic diseases and we help to educate all of our um, clients around the importance of exercise and really prescribing it as if it was a medicine, like your doctor would prescribe a drug to you. Okay, so this slide, we've got two different types of exercise training and they're both really, really important. So going back to what I was speaking to before, I would like you to use your waving hand button for anyone who has been involved in either type of activity before, whether it's cardio or whether it's strength training exercise. So if that's you, use the wave the hand or raise your hand. Yep, yeah. good, great, perfect. There's a few of you there. Very good, well done. Now, I would like you to also raise your hand if you understand the difference between the two types of exercise. So understanding the difference between cardiovascular and strength training exercise. So if you do know what the differences are, please pop up your hand, great. Good. There's a few of you there, fantastic. So I'm going to break it down into the two types. The first one being our cardiovascular exercise, which works on our aerobic energy system. So when we say aerobic, it means with oxygen. Um, this involves our cardiorespiratory system. Um, and if you're looking back and thinking back to the life program content, we generally like to talk about our energy in and our energy out. So our energy in is everything around our food, our beverages, um, and our energy out is physical activity, structured exercise. So the reason why this type of training is really important is because we need the oxygen to help fuel those fat burning enzymes, which are going to get in and reduce the size of our fat cells. So really com a common type of exercise that um, a lot are involved in. And we know that we should be doing this most, if not every day of the week. The next type of exercise we've got is resistance training or strength training. Again, the terms are interchangeable. The reason why this is so important, it involves our musculoskeletal system. This helps to improve our muscle size 
um, and improve our muscle strength. The way that this is going to aid weight management or calorie burn is the more lean muscle you have, the better your body is going to be at reducing or, or breaking down those fat stores there. So it's really important to have a combination, not only of just cardio exercise, but also strength-based exercise. When I go through the coming slides, I will, um, I will be going into a little bit more detail around what the exercise prescription looks for both of those exercise types. Okay, so the next slide is just talking about inactive older adults or inactive individuals um, and looking at why strength training is really important. We know that inactive adults lose large amount of muscle throughout their lifespan. So one of the, the conditions that is commonly associated with this is called sarcopenia. Sarcopenia literally means a loss of flesh, a loss of muscle. What happens within that cycle, it, it's a little bit of a cascade and two, two type of things happen. So the first is there is a lot of fat deposit uh, within the muscle themselves, which leads to a condition called sarcopenic obesity or uh, muscle obesity. That in turn then increases your risk for things like metabolic disease, such as diabetes. The next part of that with sarcopenia or loss of flesh is a reduction in our overall uh, muscle mass and muscle strength. This then in turn leads to a reduction in mobility and sometimes function, which can then increase your risk of falls and fractures as you get older. So in order for us to reduce our risks going forward, we sort of need to look at our strength training um, and what we're doing in that way as we get older. So again, I'm going to ask you all a question. I want you to raise your hands um, if you think that there is something that you can do to prevent this cascade of events as we get older with reducing our muscle strength and power. Good. Perfect. So again, if I was in a, a session, I would probably be asking for feedback um, and getting you to um, explain what types of things could be done to reduce this um, decline in strength as we get older. But you would be correct. For those that raised their hands, we can do something about it. So we can actually engage in strength training. Again, like I said, it's different from cardiovascular training. So evidence show um, also an improvement in our insulin sensitivity with engaging in resistance training and cardiovascular training. Through engaging this particular um, type of exercise, we can help to build our lean muscle mass, which will then in turn reduce the risk factors that I've mentioned in the previous slide. It can also increase our potential for calorie burning. So if we're looking at one of the, the goals in the LIFE program is to reduce our body weight of 5% over the six months, um, an exercise program in conjunction with a healthy eating plan can help us do this. Um, the more muscle we have, the more potential we have, like I said, to, um, to break down those fat stores. And like I said, one of the biggest things is the improvement in our overall insulin sensitivity. Uh, both cardiovascular and resistance training exercise have shown to have improvements in insulin sensitivity hours after completing an exercise regime. So this slide, I'm looking at fit principles. Um, so here it's really important to break down our fit principle with cardiovascular and strength training exercise. The first part I'm going to look at is cardiovascular. If you've got a pen and paper, you can write this down. Um, you will also be provided with the slides um, after today's webinar. So we break out our exercise into frequency, intensity, time and type for both cardio and strength training. Cardiovascular exercise, we want to aim for five to seven days per week, which is most, if not every day of the week. The intensity is moderate to vigorous. We tend to use a, a monitoring tool with our clients a lot of the time. It's a six to 20 scale where clients rate their intensity during exercise. 
So six would be very, very easy. The mid range 12 to 14 would be a moderate zone and all the way up to the higher end towards the 17, 18 would be a hard intensity to exercise. So if you are engaging in moderate um, cardiovascular activity, which is where your heart rate increases, your breathing rate increases, but it feels comfortable to continue, we wanna be aiming for about 30 minutes of this. If you were rating up the scale where you were finding you're working really hard, you can't maintain a conversation with someone, um, your breathing rate and your heart rate um, increases to quite a large amount, you could probably um, only sustain this over a short period of time. The goal for that type of training is 10 to 15 minutes. So you don't need to do the same duration for vigorous exercise as you do moderate. The different types of exercise you can engage in are things like walking, swimming, bike riding. If you've got stairs at home, you could use your, your step up and down to try and work on that cardiovascular system. So that's just to list a few. Some of you probably already have got other areas um, that you're already working within, within your cardio exercise regime. The next part is to look at our resistance training exercises or our strength training. For this type, our frequency, we want to aim for two to three times a week. So unlike our cardio, we don't have to do it every day. It's two to three times a week. Our RPE, like I said, that rate of perceived exertion is that scale of six to 20. We want to be aiming for a 13 to 15, which again is around that moderate zone. So to be specific with that, if I was asking you, say on a bicep curl, we, we're curling our arm up and down, you want to be feeling towards your last repetitions, you probably couldn't lift too many more of that weight. So if you're working at 15, you probably were only able to do another two or three before your muscle would feel completely fatigued um, and you weren't able to continue. Your time, you want to aim for two to three sets of 10 to 15 reps. So the biggest difference between cardio and resistance exercise is we're not doing it for a duration. We're doing it per reps and sets. We're using different energy systems. And the type we want to focus on is large muscle group multi-joint exercise. So we want to engage our really big muscles because the more muscle lean muscle mass we have, the better we're going to be at that calorie burn um, and improving that insulin function. Um, for those of you that aren't really sure how to go about an individualized plan or where to start with resisted exercise, you can access the health professionals, an exercise health professional, to help set up a, a tailored regime that's going to be right for you if you do have underlying injuries and you really need that tailored advice. Okay, so I'm going to go through some examples in, in the next few slides, but I just wanted to touch on our physical activity guidelines. So in this time, it's even more important to adhere um, to the National Physical Activity Guidelines. These guidelines listed are for those aged 18 to 64, but those beyond 64 years, the guidelines are still really similar. They have been modified to include doing something. So something is better than doing nothing. Trying to become really conscious of what your day is looking like if you're starting to work from home um, or if you've gone through any changes during this time really becoming mindful of what your day-to-day -day is looking like. Breaking up your time. So 150 to 300 minute, minutes of moderate physical activity or 75 to 150 uh, minutes of vigorous physical activity per week. You can break that up into hours if it's easier for you to understand. Myself, when I'm working with clients, I break it up per day. So what I say is at least 30 minutes each day, most, set, so five to seven days per week. I find that by breaking it up per day, it's a little bit more tangible than um, feeling really overwhelmed with 150 to 300 minutes. Muscle strengthening, we should be aiming, like I said, two days per week. It doesn't have to be completed every day. And I normally would say um, non-consecutive days to allow a recovery period. So you could choose a Monday and a Thursday to complete your strengthening exercise and then just trying to get some cardio on all the other days. 
We want to be active on most, if not all days. So again, what can you do around the house? Um, can you just pop out for a little bit of a walk to get some fresh air and also to, to get some activity up? And then reducing sitting time. So we know um, and you've, you've heard within the LIFE program that sitting is the new smoking. Um, and we want to try to reduce the amount of time we are spending sitting during the day. Particularly, again, if you are working from home um, and you're having to station at home, trying to not sit more than one hour at a time. Um, so thinking of different activities you can intersperse with your, your work there. So the next slide is, what does your exercise look like at home? Are you lucky enough to have a, a gym set up at home? Um, are you lucky enough to have pieces of equipment like dumbbells, like a treadmill or a bike that you can access? Or are you someone that doesn't have anything? Um, so, you know, you have to get creative with the exercise you can complete. The first part, like I said, I'm breaking it up into the two different types, is our cardiovascular or our aerobic training. So here are a few examples of what you might be able to do while you're at home. Um, we've got stair climbing for the first one. So if you're in a double storey house, you can use that potentially as your cardio, if you're safe to do so and you don't have any underlying injuries. Um, for those of you that may not live in a double storey house, thinking about your entrances, um, do you have steps going into your house or steps on the outside of your house? All you need to do is use one of them. You could start with using one of them, try it for 30 seconds to one minute, see how you feel, see how you get your heart rate and your breathing rate going. The next one we look at is walking. It's free. Um, you can do it with your, um, your partner or um, a child going around the block um, to get some walking in during your day. Or bike riding. Do you have a bike accessible that you could um, ride around with? Do you have a stationary bike at home that you could use? Or there's many, many other types of activities that you can also engage with. So again, it's just about getting creative with that. The next part is our strength or resistance training. So like I said, those of you who have dumbbells and different types of weights at home, fantastic, you can use those. For those that don't, have a think about what you've got at home, what's in your pantry. A couple of examples that I've listed there are things like chickpeas in cans, you might have soup in a can. You might have water. So one and a half litres of water that you can use as your resistance. You might have some jam jars that you can use as resistance or even TheraBands. So if you've seen a physio or an exercise physiologist in the past for an injury, they might have given you a band to take home to do some rehabilitation exercises with, using that as a bit of a resistance tool as well. If you don't have any of that, that's okay. You can actually use body weight. So another example I've got there is a person doing a push-up. So you can use your own body weight to engage in a strength or resistance training program. Things like squats, sit to stands, calf raises, wall push-ups. If you would like some more tailored advice, like I said, you can reach out to the health professional which can provide you a tailored plan. So what I've done now is I've actually given you an exercise diary example. So you don't have to use the one that's provided here. You can create your own monitoring tool or monitoring system. It is really important to document what you're doing, um, starting with a plan and setting some goals so you know what you're trying to achieve. So just like we use smart goal setting in the way of diet, we like to use smart goal setting in the way of exercise as well. With this, you will document the time spent walking, for instance, during the week or any type of cardiovascular activity you've engaged with. So you've got Monday through to Sunday, documenting your total time. So if you went out for a walk for 20 minutes and then you came home and you did another 10 minutes on a step, that would be 30 minutes total time cardio on Monday. With your resistance training exercise, like I said, two to three times a week, you want to tick the days that you've completed your resistance exercise. So if you completed it on a Tuesday, you tick the box. And then if you completed it on a Friday, you tick the box there as well. Again, this is only an example. You can use your own tracking system. There are different apps 
that you might want to have a look at. Uh, you might have your own ideas for what you're already um, using at home as well. Further to what we've been discussing, this is another exercise template for strength training that you can use at home. Again, you will be given these slides. The tip was for large muscle group, multi-joint exercise, two to three sets of 10 to 15 repetitions. So what that means is every exercise that's listed there, you're going to lift the weight for 10 to 15 reps. You have a rest for about 30 seconds to one minute, and then you complete another 10 to 15 reps. You want to aim, like I said, for two to three sets of each. This is a series of nine exercises, and I probably should have mentioned we want to aim for about six to eight different exercises at a time. We would also suggest that you seek professional advice from a qualified exercise professional, like an exercise physiologist, to consider your needs for an individualised plan if you do have any underlying conditions or injuries that, that are needing, needing to take into account. So the first one is an arm curl. You can use a can that you have in the pantry um, at differing weights. Again, the intensity is key. So you want to find that once you get to the 15, the muscle should be pretty fatigued. You couldn't do too many more after that 15 mark. If you're feeling you get to 15 and you can still keep going, increase the weight. 15 is our capped number. Try not to do more than 15 because we start working in different um, exercise parameters like endurance training. Sit to stand, really easy. Up and down out of a chair, it's a modified squat. Really good functional exercise. A forward raise with a can. Again, you could use TheraBands that you might have using that as your resistance as well. A wall press is a really good modified uh, push-up. So you don't have to be able to do a push-up from, from the floor. You can use your wall, which makes it easier. A calf raise, so up onto your toes, down to the floor. You can make that harder by holding weights in your hand or doing a single leg calf raise. A side arm raise with a can or a TheraBand. A step up, so like I said, this exercise can be used for cardiovascular training. It can also be used for strength training. The way that that would change, cardio, we would do it for a duration of time. Strength training, we'd do it for repetitions. So you'd aim for your 10 to 15 reps as opposed to a two minute time frame. An upright row uh, with a can or a TheraBand and then lunges. So that's a nice snapshot of what a strength training program might look like for you at home. Okay, so the next part I wanted to touch on was exercise and step tracking devices. The first one is the pedometer. Now being at home or uh, having limitations with our activity and what we can engage with, pedometers are a really good tool to track our incidental activity. You can get really fancy devices that you wear around your wrist which track your steps or you can purchase the pedometers from sports stores, um, Kmart, Target, where you just clip them onto your pants, you wear them all day, and it will look at the amount of steps you've done each day. We generally say to try and aim for 10,000 steps a day, so from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to bed, but I like to say just start with what you're doing. Get a number, write it down, and then build from there. So if you're doing 4,000 steps in that day, trying to then do a few more steps the following day. You've got things like Fitbits or Garmin's. I might get a show of hands for those that are here who has got a Fitbit or a Garmin that they track their activity with. So I'm gonna use the raise the hand function. Yeah, so there, yeah, so there's a couple there. So other devices that you can use um, which sync to your smartphone to track your activity throughout the day as well. And then if you've got smartphones like an Android or an iPhone, there are different health apps in there. You've got S Health, you've got um, Apple Health in the iPhone as well. If you haven't had a look, have a scroll through and see what they offer and you can set yourself with a plan there. Here are a few tracking mobile apps. These are all free as well. 
So there's some links there if you wanted to jot them down. You've got um, Strava and All Trails, which are different sort of um, walking apps. All Trails maps out different hikes that might be within your area. You've got My Fitness Pal, which you can input actual food diaries as well as your exercise um, within that app. You've got Map My Walk and Map My Fitness, which tracks the routes that you've been on um, and gives you the total distance. So with the Map My Fitness, there's actually a 2020 challenge at the moment, trying to aim for 1,020 kilometres in the year 2020. So it's a free challenge. For those of you that might be up to it, we're in April now, um, but see how you go. If you wanted to sign up to that challenge, each time you go out, you press start, which logs your walk, and then it will, in the background, track how many kilometres you do each day. And then we've got the Couch to 5K, again, which is a free app, and it looks at grading your running for those that are interested in running um, and sets you up with some plans there to, to try and get, to get your running up. Here are a few links to some helpful online resources. So the first is Exercise Right, and I've got the link there. They have got some really good resources around the importance of exercise in really nice visuals. So the ones that I used earlier in the presentation are accessible on their website. They have got different ideas for how to become a little bit more active during this COVID-19 time. They have also got access to a whole range of exercise videos that you might want to explore as well. So I'll go through in a little bit more detail in the next slide. You've got the ESSA website, who is uh, our peak professional body as exercise physiologists. If you wanted some individualised exercise advice, you could jump on to the website there, use the find an AEP search function, and that will look for an exercise physiologist in your area. You've also got Exercise is Medicine. So they offer a lot of fact sheets and resources for different chronic conditions, ranging from heart disease to cancer to Parkinson's disease. And they talk about the benefits of exercise and the types of exercise you should be engaging with for those types of conditions. So just a couple of resources there that you might want to explore. This is what the Exercise Right website looks like for those of you that want to have a look there. Like I said, they do have a range of home-based workouts. So if you're scrolling down their screen, you'll be able to have a look to see what they're offering for different fitness ranges. You can pick and choose a video that might be best suited to you. So I would encourage you to go and have a look at that as well. Just a couple of key points, so tips for keeping active. I like to break up the activity into incidental and structured activities. So your incidental activity is everything you're doing each and every day from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to bed. It includes things like going out to the shopping centre to get your essential groceries. It includes things like housework that you have to do. Um, and it's where your, st your step tracking device comes in to have a look to see it, how active you are objectively throughout your day with a step count. It's all about sitting less, moving more. So trying to reduce our sitting time less than one hour at a time. So if you're finding yourself sitting majority of the day, maybe that might be a place to start just by reducing your sitting time. Schedule regular gardening and housework each day. So making a plan for yourself and what you want to do where you know that you will be active incidentally because you're breaking up those tasks each day. I would encourage it doing it that way rather than trying to get everything done on one day and then you're not doing anything for the rest of the week, trying to really schedule it in. Sometimes I have clients that come to me and say they have a very active job and they might get over 10,000 steps just within their day job. So does that count as exercise? I would normally say you're just very lucky that you've got a really active job. We still need to have structured exercise, which is the next part. We want to make sure we're doing cardio. Like I said, most, if not every day of the week, something as simple as a walk. Going out, walking around your block. If you can, trying to get at least 30 minutes. Self-paced, 
intensity is key. So it shouldn't be so light where you're not even feeling um, your heart rate increasing. You should feel a bit of a huff and puff. And then aim for strength training two to three times a week. So I've given you an example of what strength training could look like at home. Feel free to use that template. Um, like I said, if you need any individualised advice, make sure you seek that out. But again, two to three times a week of structured strength training. Just a couple more things to note. We, it's really important to set a plan. So throughout the life course, we speak often about SMART goal setting. So SMART is being specific about what you want to achieve. So increasing your activity levels. Measurable, achievable, realistic and time bound. There's no point in setting a goal that you can't achieve. Uh, it's really important to understand how to set goals that you can tick off in relation to your exercise. So a goal doesn't have to be for the next year. Your goal could be for the next day. What do you want to achieve today? So it might be, I'm going to go out for a five minute walk today. Once you've done that, you can tick it off. Being successful with your attempts at smart goal setting is going to improve your motivation going forward with continuing to pave the way with your physical activity. So again, thinking about where you're at, make your goals achievable, make them realistic and give yourself a time frame. Time doesn't have to be over an extended period, it can be as, as small as you like. You can access the ESSA website for where to find the right exercise professional, like I'd mentioned. During this time, we are, or there are some health providers that are minimising their face-to-face -face contact with clients to ensure the safety of everyone involved. So there is telehealth available. Some of you may have already accessed this through other health professionals or GPs, and it is something that exercise physiologists are now engaging with their clients in. Um, it's where you use your smart device and you video conference through a consultation so they can actually see and set you up with an individualised plan at home. The next point is to participate in Active April. So there's a link there that goes for the month of April where you document all types of activity. You can join a group, um, get a group of friends so you all can keep each other motivated. Uh, I think there's different prizes also in there to be one potentially. And also make it fun. So if you've got your family, try and get the family involved around ways you can be a little bit more active at home. By making it fun, there's a higher chance that you're going to adhere to the exercise as well. All right, just to finish off, I wanted to go through a little bit of a breathing exercise. So it's a diaphragmatic breathing. Some of you may have participated in this before. For others, it might be new. Um, it's the contraction of the diaphragm, the expansion of the belly, and the deepening inhalation and exhalation. So a lot of the time, this exercise is used for those with underlying respiratory conditions like COPD, um, which helps to reduce our overall breathing rate, helps to strengthen our diaphragm, reduces our oxygen demand, which requires less effort and energy to breathe. And I think given our current circumstances that we're all involved in, it's a good opportunity to redirect our attention. So I'd like to go through a little bit of an activity with you now before we move on to some Q&A. So I would like you to adopt a healthy seated position for me. Um, I would like you to sit comfortably with your knees bent and your shoulders, head and neck relaxed. And I would like you to close your eyes. If you're lucky enough to be lying down, you can do this lying down as well. So now what I want you to do is place one hand on your upper chest and the other hand just below your rib cage. You probably can't see my lower hand. This will allow you to feel your diaphragm move as you breathe. Breathe in slowly through your nose so that your stomach moves out against your hand. The hand on your chest should remain as still as possible. Tighten your stomach muscles, letting them fall inward as you exhale through your mouth with pursed lips. 
The hand on your upper chest must remain as still as possible. I want you to concentrate that your exhalation is twice as long as your inhalation. If you count to three when you breathe in, count to six when you breathe out. I want you to try this activity for five repetitions. All right, when you've done your five, take your time. I might just get you to wave your hands. Great. You do have access to another breathing exercise within your workbooks as well. And it's probably a really good idea to practice these types of activities each day, just to sort of bring your attention back and focus on your, yourself during this time. And you can practice it as many times in the day. So you can do five minutes in the morning, five minutes at night, but really trying to schedule again some time to do some of that mindfulness, deep breathing exercise um, can be really beneficial. So these are my references from the information delivered today for those of you that are interested. But again, um, this will be provided to you after today's webinar. And I think now we have some time